So welcome to Gender Matters, the 2016 presidential election. Um, this was prompted by the feeling that many of us had that gender had been pretty much ignored or underanalyzed uh, prior to the election, and that the same thing was continuing after the election. And of course, there are many factors involved in this election, but certainly gender is one of them. Um, and we saw some familiar cross cultural themes in explanations for the election, um, but we know that U.S. politics is pervasively, deeply gendered with massive consequences for uh, women and for men. And I think that was part of what produced this incredible outpouring of people on January 21st, the largest single day protest in U.S. history. Um, with almost five million people worldwide. So the panel theme asks what can feminist anthropology offer uh, in terms of perspectives and actions um, in trying to understand the 2016 election. Uh, the original idea was to have several people present very short presentations to get the conversation started, because there hasn't been much of a conversation really within anthropology. Um, so the format is going to be that each person will present between five and eight minutes after an introduction that I will be giving. Uh, and again, we know that's not enough time for any of our presentations, but it's getting the conversation uh, started. So one of the um, comments that was made in a group of feminists actually writing about the election, non-anthropologists incidentally, was that Hillary Clinton was the wrong woman at the wrong time, which makes you ask who would be the right woman and when would be the right time. And so that requires us to first take a little bit of a historical perspective on why the women who had come before her had never reached um, the presidential nomination, much less being president. Um, so we'll take a quick look at the current situation, past situation, and also a cross-national perspective. <coughs> I can't possibly do justice to this data here, <coughs> but I want to point out that in 19... Um, 16, in, uh, Jeanette Rankin was the first person, Republican from Montana, um, to be elected to the House of Representatives. But as of 1971, there were 3%. Even in 1982, when I first started looking and comparing with India, the US, there were only 3%. At that time, 5% of women's um, in Indian parliament were women. Uh, 1991, 6%. By the quote, year of the woman, there were overall 10 percent in, um, in Congress, in both houses. Um, by 2017, um, there were still less than 20 percent, as you can see, 19.6 percent. Um, in 2017, there were two states that have never, had never elected a woman to Congress, to either house. One of those was Mississippi, the other was Vermont. If you look at the state legislatures, again, less than 5% in 1971, there has been some further progress, almost 25%. But let us recall that women constitute half of the population, over half of the voters registered, and even more voting. So this is an appalling number that we've almost come to take for granted, that 20% is somehow good. If we look at statewide executive offices, which is with the real political leadership offices, and which is where in the past many uh, presidents and presidential candidates have come from, we find, again, very low representation of women, and particularly governors of states. That has been one of the major routes to becoming president. Currently, there are only six women, significantly two Democrats and four Republicans. The highest has been 10. So that's 
a very small number, and that was 1992 and 2002. So we haven't been going very far, uh, very moving forward very much. I put down here no clear party differences. That's a huge conversation in itself. 22 states have never had a woman governor, and if you look at which states they are, they include such, quote, progressive states as California, New York, Massachusetts had two year, a two-year period of, of somebody there. Um, and then you can look at the rest, and there's no clear um, relationship. Uh, again, municipal, major cities, there are none, no women in the top 15, largest 15 women cities. And again, you look ever, that's ever, and that includes, again, such progressive bastions as New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, et cetera. If we look at other countries, and we often advise other countries about gender issues, we find that the situation of women is significantly below other countries. And that's not just recently. When I first looked in 1982, there were virtually no women in parliaments any place, but still the U.S. was slightly below Britain and um, below India. There has been a fairly substantial increase in other countries recently, as in the U.S., but we have not kept up with the rest of the world. You can see from 2017, the global average is 24%. So we're below the global average. And it's highest in Nordic countries, but all the Americas, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and then you get to the United States. And you can see our rank is 101 out of 193 countries. We're just above Kyrgyzstan. And again, it's not just 2017. Our rank has actually gone down over the last two decades. How many minutes am I? If we look at women heads of states, 99 countries have had a female leader, which includes hereditary, but 69 countries have elected a woman. And while that's not a wonderful representation, there's currently only two, 22 women, you have to ask why in the United States have we not even managed one? And again, you can see that there were only 12 women who have ever entered the presidential primaries and two VPs neither elected. So what's the problem? Again, who is the right woman the right time? How many minutes in that? Okay, so that's the quick summary. The invisibility of gender in U.S. political life, threats to the traditional family which have gone unrecognized, and some very cross-cultural familiar themes having to do with patriarchal families, with patriarchal societies, with male authority over female. Um, so I will skip that. And I think the invisibility of gender in U.S. Politi politics is particularly um, 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 obvious in the analysis of Trump supporters, uh, especially white evangelical Christians, but also alt-right groups like the Proud Boys who are talked about in terms of racism, but they also are trying to preserve the traditional family. And Although there has been a clear bargain between Trump and the evangelical Christians, the issues are not just abortion and gun rights, which are an interesting juxtaposition in terms of male and female roles. There are a host of other things from uh, abstinence only, um, uh, education to uh, restrictions on contraception to not supporting single or divorced mothers uh, and basically traditional family values. And perhaps the best example of this is Judge Moore uh, in Alabama. If you look at his platform, it clearly says in the section on family, which is a big section, a strong family based on marriage between one man and one woman is and should remain our only guide and model. I oppose abortion, same-sex marriage, civil unions, and all other threats to the traditional family order 
And if you analyze the talk and the discourse around it, it's definitely about male, female roles as well as these other kinds of things, but it doesn't get much play. So when we look, we see some familiar cross-cultural themes. Patriarchal family and the relationship between that and major religions and stratified societies as a way of controlling women, sexuality, and reproduction in order to reproduce the existing order, and one of the best examples is anti-miscegenation in the US. Um, females as transgressors and the parallels between what's going on here and the rise of religious orthodox fundamentalism in other societies. So to end with, this, this, this image and Nutcracker is still available online widely. I can't think of a better symbol of threats to the patriarchal family and to patriarchy than this um, widely bought symbol of, is America ready for this nutcracker? And many people talked about the election as who was the traditional candidate in the establishment versus change. I would argue that Hillary Clinton represented, at least in the realm of social relationships, all of the changes that have occurred for the last 55 years. So she was the symbol, at least, of change. Thank you. Um, Susan Seymour. Could we have the next PowerPoint? It's up. It's up. It's up. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've entitled my remarks today The Psychology of Patriarchy in the 2016 presidential election. And I'm going to take a more psychological perspective than Carol has. And I picked out Kate Millett, as you may know, died this summer. She published Sexual Politics in 1970. And I picked out two quotes from that book, which are pertinent to my remarks today. It is interesting that many women do not recognize themselves as discriminated against. No better proof could be found of the totality of their conditioning. Patriarchy's chief institution is the family. We've just been hearing about that. It is both a mirror of and a connection with the larger society, a patriarchal unit within a patriarchal whole. In case you haven't noticed, we US Americans live in a patriarchal society. Those of us who were active during the second wave of women's movement of the 1970s thought we had made significant change during the past nearly 50 years. But the 2016 presidential election has seriously questioned that. Certainly the election of an inexperienced and openly misogynist and racist male over a woman with sub substantive experience and suitable credentials was formidable, was a formidable backlash to the civil rights era for women, African Americans, and other minorities. But the election has exposed more than that. Patriarchies rely not just on hierarchies of men, but also on the accommodation of women. And we need to better understand how those systems operate psychologically. Why do women help to reproduce the male-dominated systems in which they live? Why do they help to protect men who abuse other women? Why, for instance, does President Trump have such female accomplices as Ivanka Trump, Kellyanne Conway, and Sarah Huckabee Sa Huckabee, Huckabee, excuse me, Sanders. That, that was a good alliteration. Why did women act as enablers, honeypots, so that a Harvey Weinstein could assault and abuse hundreds of women in the film industry? As a former dean of faculty, I have seen, up close, unfortunately, these kinds of activities by women who considered themselves feminists. I have spent much of my career trying to understand North India's patriarchal family system, beginning with the early socialization of children into gender roles and gender hierarchies. And I understand how girls get socialized into the system and what motivates many of them to maintain the system. Nonetheless, India has 
succeeded in having a female prime minister, a female president, and several female state governors. They are a leading country with respect to the number and length of time women have had significant political power, way ahead of the United States, which Carol has already alluded to. We should be asking why, and I have some hypotheses. As children, girls in North India learn about male and female power hierarchies within their joint families. So they learn to negotiate the patriarchal system and, and to assume leadership roles within it when they become adult women, especially when they become mothers and mothers-in-law. Furthermore, women need role models. Hindu girls have powerful female deities with which to identify. What do we have comparable? All I could think of was Wonder Woman. I have a quote here from the anthro Indian anthropologist Manisha Roy, who's writing, uh, thinking back to her childhood, and it captures the power of having female deities. As a child, I joined the extended family in the celebration of annual worshiping of the Hindu goddess Durga at my paternal, paternal grandfather's village home in West Bengal. The imposing image of Durga with 10 arms holding weapons and riding a lion while killing the ferocious demon was so securely imprinted within my soul that even to this day, she accompanies me. All I need is to close my eyes and she appears. I feel protected. I'm not gonna finish the quote, but I have spent many years watching children who go through these prayers and festivals, and it is embedded in them, and those are powerful images. I have argued in the past that feminist and psychological anthropologists need to collaborate in order to better understand how gender systems in any society operate and get reproduced. And I have a reference here to a volume of ethos that uh, I helped edit and wrote the introduction and made that argument, and I feel like very little progress has been made since 2004. Our two subfields have been bifurcated for a long time and continue to be. Two years ago, I participated in a week-long seminar entitled The Psychology of Patriarchy that brought together feminist and psychologically oriented anthropologists, psychologists, and sociologists, out of which a book has been produced that will be published in 2018, entitled The Psychology of Patriarchy, Understanding Why Women Accommodate to Beliefs and Practices that Disempower Them. However, we were primarily examining non-US societies. The lens needs to be turned homeward. I have tried to turn the lens homeward a bit by doing a little bit of field work since the election, once I recovered enough to be able to talk to Trump voters. In order to better understand the election of an inexperienced misogynist man over a woman with considerable government experience to the highest office in the United States, I have begun interviewing some Trump voters who belong to a category largely ignored by journalists and political analysts, that is college-educated, uh, professional Euro-American men and women from California, a blue state, residing in one of two cosmopolitan cities, Los Angeles or the San Francisco Bay Area. My data set is small, 13 individuals at this point, five women, eight men, but revealing. One set belongs to my generation, people in their 70s and 80s. Another set belongs to a younger generation who are in their 40s and 50s. None of my interviewees had strong religious beliefs. In the course of our discussions, I asked about each person's political party, affiliation, and voting history. Some were staunch Republicans, some not. I asked why they had decided to vote for Trump over Clinton. I was looking for implicit gender biases. As professional people speaking with a female anthropologist, they were generally careful not to reveal overt sexist attitudes, but they ultimately did. They used a variety of negative adjectives to describe Clinton, but not Trump. And I have these on the, the table. 
So the things that emerge were, she's weak, narcissistic, unconvincing, bossy, untrustworthy in a variety of ways, uh, dangerous in lots of ways, and the bottom line from some was women are needed in the home to keep family together. That speaks exactly to what Carol was <laughs> addressing a few minutes ago. So I felt like I had professional people who sounded not unlike Hochschild's interviewees in Louisiana, although they belonged to a different class, and they were worried about the same kinds of things, remaining in their position of power and the women not understanding the way in which they were socialized into this system. Thank you. Our next presenter is Christine Cray. Hello, everyone. This year, I've been engaged in ethnographic research in Rochester, New York, where I work, related to public memory, Susan B. Anthony, and the 2016 presidential election. Some of this appears in a book a manuscript that I co-edited with historian and journalist colleagues Tamar Carroll and Hinda Mandel, entitled Nasty Women and Bad Hombres, which is under review. Today, I want to comment on how anthropology can shed light on symbolic action within elect electoral campaigns, in particular, the ritual expression of political sentiments that are inchoate, muted, or silenced. The thunderous misogyny of Donald Trump, who railed against political correctness, gave license to men throughout the country to unleash vitriol against Hillary Clinton in ways that demeaned womanhood more generally. His bullying of Megyn Kelly, blood coming out of her whatever, Elizabeth Warren as Pocahontas, Ghazala Khan, maybe she wasn't allowed to have anything to say, and Alicia Machado, check out sex tape, all rested upon notions of the female body as polluting, cartoonish, wretched, and debased. Journalists had been compiling lists of Trump's sexist comments and history of sexual harassment and misconduct. This was all before the Access Hollywood tape was released on October 7th in which he bragged about committing sexual assault, after which another 11 women came forward accusing him of having touched them sexually without their consent. His alliance with Steve Bannon had brought the invective of the Breitbart crowd into mainstream social media as commenters hurled misogynistic insults as political, at political opponents, cuck, snowflake, beta, implying that dominance was a masculinist enterprise. Female concern, sorry, feminist concerns were shut down as even while women increasingly recognized and rejected this misogyny, they were admonished that making it a political issue equated to identity politics. Trump accused Clinton of playing the woman card and bloggers said that women shouldn't vote with their vaginas, somehow delegitimizing gender consciousness altogether. Once feminist concerns were hushed, Gaslighting twisted the definition of reality as Donald Trump claimed that nobody has more respect for women than I do and that the access to Hollywood tape was just locker room talk. Disrespected, hushed, and mesmerized by audacious mendacity, women found what Chen and Whipple call intimate publics in social media, such as in Pantsuit Nation, in which to talk with one another to reframe the conversation. But Pantsuit Nation is a secret group. The silencing had worked. Women were angry, but many only shared their rage in sheltered spaces. In Rochester, New York, the sticker ritual in which women affix their I voted stickers to Susan B. Anthony's gravestone on election days had first received media attention in 2014, so it's new. Um, it was always very small scale, and on the day of the New York State primary in April 2016, by the end of the day, only 28 stickers were on the gravestone, right? The most that had ever been photographed in a single day. So that's in April 2016. On election day in November, somewhere between 8 and 12,000 people visited the grave. Clinton was expected to win, although with a narrow margin, and cemetery visitors were excited about the possibility of the first woman president. Yet underneath that excitement were fear and loathing. 
loathing of Trump's disrespect for women, and fear that he had changed the culture and made misogyny great again. In interviews with me, people talked about him without using his name, like Voldemort, who you, he who shall not be named. Anthropologists can unpack political ritual, as over a century we've built up mythological tools and analytical lenses for that purpose. Ritual, as symbolic action, may entail few words, little exegesis. It's therefore a perfect vehicle with which to express inchoate sentiments, things that people are only beginning to conceptualize, or sentiments forcibly silenced, just like feminist rage on election day. Although the gathering was at Susan B. Anthony's grave, the ceremonial actions were really not about her. Since Durkheim, we've known that ritual totems are really just symbols of the social group. So what was the social group that was forming around Susan B. Anthony as a symbol? In Notes Toward a Performative Theory of Assembly, Judith Butler notes that the embodied action of an assembly says more than the words that are used to describe that political action. The collection of bodies itself is an indexical sign of the right to assembly. People take up space. They affirm their right to the political. In converging upon the grave of the famous suffragist on election day, the cemetery visitors affirmed their right to participate in the political process with concern for women's rights. Almost all of the cemetery visitors took photos of themselves at the grave to share on social media. The photo was part of the ritual action, as cemetery goers aimed to cast themselves as feminist and to rework their social world. The ritual co-participants became witnesses to the symbolic act of standing up for equal rights. The ritual thereby became a vow or a social contract. When participants shared their photos of the sticker ritual with their social media contacts, they likewise converted those contacts into witnesses who would hold them accountable for the commitments symbolically expressed. And finally, the gravestone provided authenticity to what was, for almost everyone, a brand new ritual activity. Applying the sticker to the gravestone was a simple addition to a pre-existing ritual, depositing gifts at graves. And as such, it could appeal to those who wanted to tap into something deep and biting. In fact, the cemetery goers were not seeking something radical or revolutionary, but merely the fulfillment of the ancient promise of equal rights inscribed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Gravestones symbolize time depth, the connection between past and present. They're firm, durable, grounded, embedded, ancient, sacred, even if weathered and worn by the elements. Gravestones persist. The grave site of a famous social activist was the ideal meeting ground for feminists who wanted to take a public stand in support of values that they considered to be threatened, but yet ancient and non-negotiable, the dignity and rights of the individual. Our next presenter is M. Gabriela Torres. Sexual violence produces cultural and political change, the kind of cultural change that enables particularly pervasive forms of male authoritarian rule to fester. Let me explain this by focusing outside ourselves. I have seen this in Guatemala through military dictatorships and most recently in 2015 with a presidential election that pitted a populist TV celebrity named Jimmy Morales against a former first lady with decades of political experience. Sound familiar? Like many other populists in Latin America, Morales, a TV personality infamous for his blackface skits, was unapologetic about using fear and racial stereotypes to reach a certain segment of the electorate. And it worked for him just like it did for Trump. In 2015, Sandra Torres was running for president for the second time, and public opinion was decidedly against her. She was shunning her role as a traditional wife and ferociously taking assertive political leadership of her party in her run for president. 
Assessing the aftermath of the loss, one editorial noted that her candidacy was discredited through thousands of parallel stories transforming her into a type of power with the semblance of a woman and the body of an animal. Videos, jokes, and gossip of all kinds circulated and fueled the famous hatred called sandrophobia. And this is not the end of the parallels between Guatemala and the US. Jimmy Morales, Guatemala's current president, then was a newcomer described during the race as lewd, crude, and inappropriate. Despite his ties to power, he campaigned as staunchly anti-establishment and boasted his minimal governance experience. Guatemalans, like Trump supporters in the US, felt they needed to change the system. And the promise of a newcomer who is unafraid to call it like it is was an alluring idea. Empty promises to battle corruption is just one of the things that enabled Morales to triumph over the unpalatable first lady. The tough guy who not coincidentally also has a way with the ladies is a too common trope in Latin American leadership that has also taken hold in the United States. Continuing with the old anthropological trick to focus on the other, on Guatemala in this case, because it is not us, I want to return to the relationship between sexual violence and the outsider populist tough guy figurehead that our two countries share. Learning from Guatemala, I want to make three points. In Guatemala, authoritarian male figureheads persist because they actually personify the practices of sexual violence that have already been routinized into the historical workings of the state. My work in Guatemala, on the Guatemalan state has documented how it employed sexual violence to support genocide as part of massacres, terror campaigns, and, structure, and torture. Coincidentally, the state here in the US has authored this kind of violence against Native American and Puerto Rican women in forced sterilization campaigns and in the history of legal and social acceptance of sexual violence against African American women. Point two. In Guatemala, Amer authoritarian figureheads persist because they reproduce forms of sexual violence and impunity that are already in quotidian circulation. Femicide in Guatemala is made possible in part because the display of violated women's bodies has routinized a perception of women's bodies as bodies, as objects to be used or things to be rescued. Importantly, the representation of violated women that circulate in Guatemala narrate out the perpetrators of violence. While in the US, violated bodies are less frequent in comparison, we have seen the naturalization of gender-based violence, often sexual violence, in the rhetorical misogyny that Christine spoke about, rhetorical misogyny that has been emboldened by the cloak of the tweet. This is just one of the forms of gender-based violence and impunity that we tolerate. The possibly ephemeral cry of Me Too has made clear that the tolerance of sexual violence in the US permeates politics, sports, schools, businesses. Here, the perpetrators of different degrees of sexual violence have and continue to rely on its power to govern and discipline the bodies of women for their own ends, as they also do in Guatemala. The last point that I want to make is that authoritarian figureheads produce cultural legacies that amplify sexual violence. This has certainly been the case in Guatemala where authoritarianism has left a violent legacy, making it one of the most violent places in the world. Guatemala is infamous for femicide. Rates of sexual violence are higher now than when they were used during genocide, making the tolerance of sexual violence a forced practice of everyday life as violated women's bodies appear unquestioned and ubiquitously in social media, the newspapers, TV, and city streets. This is a practice to which Guatemalans have no longer a choice but to participate, to tolerate, because impunity has taken full hold. 
My sketch today is but a beginning of an anthropological feminist gender analysis of the 2016 election from a different vantage point. In its brevity, I do hope that it suggests that closer attention needs to be paid to the cultural mechanics that enable populist authoritarian rule to persist. Sexual violence is one of those mechanics that scaffolds authoritarian forms of rule, and does so not just because it shapes masculinity, but because it is interwoven into our very cultural fabric, our interpersonal social relations, into the state, and into the very exercise of power. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Micaela Di Leonardo. Thank you, beautiful pronunciation. I honor uh, the women who have come before me. They're very, very smart feminist papers. And I honor the students of mine I see uh, in the audience, Almita, Elisa, and Beth. Uh, you are our feminist future. I don't need to inform this audience that we are living in appalling and perilous times. In my few minutes today, I want to talk about two important themes that were underlined by Donald Trump's completely unanticipated Electoral College win in 2016, despite abundant evidence of his profound misogyny, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, criminality, complete inability to distinguish truth from falsehood, in fact, his glorying and rapid fire lying, and total ignorance of the actual business of government and of any facts whatsoever about the United States and the world of nations. The first theme is one that I've spent the last 45 years coming to understand more clearly as a feminist activist, scholar, and professor, and that is that there is no such thing as just gender. Just as feminism across the centuries and in every country in the world has always taken adjectives, liberal, socialist, affluent, working class focused, black or Latina or Asian, so gendered material and social relations across time and space are always cross-cut by many other lines of stratification and discrimination. In the United States over the decades of the second wave, the key cross-cutting lines were sexuality, class, and race. Second wave activists after the unpleasant Betty Friedan lavender menace period got on board with LBGTQ rights fairly rapidly, aided by radical feminist agitation. I well remember getting schooled in the mid-1970s as a clueless straight woman by my lesbian sisters in the rape crisis movement. Radical feminists also succeeded in making widespread male violence against women a central mainstream feminist issue. Not that we gained much mainstream traction, but perhaps now we will. Marxist feminists harried liberal feminists on labor, race, class, and international women's issues with slower results. Liberal feminists stuck to their guns and convinced others of the key importance of feminist legislation, policy, governance, and of the necessity of revolutionizing child rearing and education. Organized groups of black, Latina, Asian, and Native American women fought male sexism in their own populations and the stubborn racism and classism among many white feminists. In general, American feminists pulled themselves together pretty damn well over the last four decades. The real issue is our collective failure to convert the American population at large. We second wave American feminists have tried and failed decade after decade to win the ideological war for women's rights. The anti-feminist backlash to 1970s feminism was instantaneous and extremely well-funded. It was part of the long march over the decades of the American anti-democratic, anti-labor, racist, misogynist, homophobic, xenophobic, anti-environmentalist right. Ms. Magazine reported in the 1980s in agony that the majority of American women didn't identify as feminists, despite benefiting greatly from the new women's rights legislation and policy that feminists had painfully fought for and won. Susan Faludi's wonderful 1991 study, Backlash, laid out the contours of powerful, ongoing anti-feminist campaigns, and the needle hasn't moved much in the decades since, as we saw in November. This is where I want to intervene. We all know the depressing facts that 53% of white women who did vote, voted for Trump, and that percentage was only reduced to a depressing 45% for college-educated white women. 
But of course, only 43% of college-educated white women voted for Obama in 2012. Yet black women voted overwhelmingly, 93% of them, for Hillary Clinton. Here is where the race optic becomes crucial. And my second theme was nowhere near crucial enough to the Clinton campaign. The Brookings Institute concluded that race minority voters put Obama over the top in 2012. The white vote as a percentage of all votes had declined in every election since 1992, given the demographic transition in the US, and may it continue. Uh, but in 2016, white turnout bumped up a bit, while black turnout dipped more than 7% from its 2012 high. A significant element of that dip was the efficient Republican voter suppression machine. Some was clearly due to Russian election meddling, but the most important element was the Clinton campaign's failure to put money and bodies into black media, anti-voter suppression efforts, and get out the vote organizing in black precincts. Given the flat Latino turnout, I suspect the same goes for those Americans. Chasing the white female voters whom we feminist activists have failed to convert over the last four decades was a losing proposition. The winning progressive coalitions of the future will need to be distinctly anti-racist as well as feminist, pro-LGBTQ and social democratic, and will need to rely on race minority leadership. Here's an example of that under-acknowledged race minority leadership. For the past 14 years, I've been studying the most popular black radio show in the US. The Tom Joyner Morning Show reaches more than 8 million black and other Americans, largely adults and lar largely working to middle class. That is the bulk of the black American population for four hours every weekday morning. And while the show incorporates music, self-help, and a lot of wicked humor, it has distinctly progressive politics and has since the mid-1990s. Seriously feminist, LBGTQ positive, economically populist, often anti-imperialist, broadly pro-civil rights for all minority populations, and is extremely politically engaged. It is no exaggeration to say that the TJMS was a key element in both of Obama's election triumphs, a point the former president himself made repeatedly on the show, and I have the transcripts. And yet the TJMS is barely acknowledged in in the larger American public sphere and little studied. This invisible element, elephant in the black li national living room, sorry, start again, this inv invisible elephant in the national living room phenomenon reflects the larger public sphere neglect of ordinary black Americans, as opposed to the well-off celebrities and poor criminals and crime victims who capture most mainstream media attention. Here's an example of the automatic progressive coalition politics of the show. TGMS worked hard for Clinton, despite her campaign's failures to pony up, although they warned about that repeatedly, had her on the show frequently and were and are far more creatively nasty about Trump and his acolytes than even our best comics and late night hosts. The morning after the election, they were on the air at 5 a.m., devastated and attempting to regroup. Comedian Chris Paul's heartbroken, deeply moving morning after political doggerel included a panoply white racism, misogyny, xenophobia of progressive coalition points. And this is an African-American male speaking. There are no jokes to tell and no funny songs to make because we're living a nightmare with four years to wake. Last night my country, tis of thee, lost all her majestic dignity. We elected a person whose entire campaign was built on insults and inflicting pain. He lit the fire of the angry white male and let it burn on his campaign trail. And on election day, the angry white hate carried him to wins in majority states. What do we say to our daughters after electing a man who bragged about assault and doing things with his hands? And what do our Latino neighbors make of this win and a new America that doesn't include them? And where do we as black Americans go, for here, go from here? There's much, much more in my book, Black Radio, now in press. We white American feminists need to know our history better, use it strategically in activism, and do a significantly better job of recognizing our allies of color. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Matthew Gutman. I want to focus not on the 66 million, but the 63 million the figure that is, I think, remaining understudied, under, misunderstood. 
53% of white women who voted voted for Trump. 4% of black women who voted were for Trump. 26% of Latinas, 62% of white women without college degrees, and 51%, a slim majority of college-educated white women who voted, supported Clinton. And I add here who voted because a lot of people didn't vote. And so I think it's important in terms of talking about majorities and whatnot to actually qualify things. These white women did not come out of nowhere. And the belief that working class women were just doing their husband's bidding makes absolutely no sense. Less than 48% of women without college degrees are married. Dramatic, there's been a dramatic increase in working class women struggling to support families on their own. Clinton used to have a lot of support among working class white women. So one question is what happened? An indication is that all the post-election talk of Clinton having lost the working class served among other things to thoroughly erase gender from most discussions as if there were no women in the working class. Mm -hmm. Donald John Trump was elected president of the United States in 2016. This happened not despite his repeated remarks endorsing sexual assaults on women, but because of them. He was chosen to lead because tens of millions of people, 63 million people voted for him, remember, Tens of millions of people in the United States believe boys will be boys and that those who disagree should get over it. Nowhere has this acquiescence to male bad behavior been more in evidence in recent years in the United States than with Donald Trump's brutal and naked sexism. Why aren't more people bothered? Or why aren't people bothered more? Answering these questions requires more than flip and facile retort. To what extent do people disparage or even despise the words and behavior only to dismiss it as locker room boast and banter? <coughs> What's most shocking in, the ass, in, in these statements is it that Donald Trump once said these things or that despite listening to this wanton bragging about sexual assault, tens of millions of people in the United States voted for him anyway? Or finally, was the most staggering surprise that none of it seemed to matter. Even boasting about physically attacking women, Trump still got elected. And we're not talking simply about people who unashamedly countenance violence against women. We're talking about people who oppose this kind of attitude and actions, in part anyway. That they could nonetheless vote for Trump means not only that they were willing to overlook sinful behavior and that they were able to rationalize those words and deeds as unfortunate, consequences of boys being boys. There was complicity in the acquiescence, and the collusion was rooted in core beliefs about men's and women's natures. They, whoopsie. Donald Trump is the living embodiment of the phrase. He exalts in its implications. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Trump supporters have embraced his open avowal of sexual aggression. We should not have been shocked that 63 million people voted for Trump in 2016. If pussy grabbing was okay to millions of Trump supporters and overlooked by many other, millions of others, this should not have been unexpected. That's on us that it was unexpected. And there should have been little surprise that misogyny against Clinton and women in general was both pandemic and treated by tens of millions of people in the United States as a minor issue in 2016. Nor was it as simple as saying that because of misogyny, a woman couldn't get elected in the United States. 66 million people testified to the fact that a woman could get elected. The question is, why didn't one? The election was an assertion of, male, of white male privilege and impunity to be enjoyed by powerful men who committed sexual assaults against women. Tens of millions of people did not overlook Trump's statements. They appreciated them for their deliberate excess. The idea that Trump could say this and still get elected anyway was beside the point. 
we needed to appreciate that for many citizens in the United States, it was precisely because of these ideas that Trump should be elected. It was easier to understand. I have a button at home that says, you know, vote for Trump, Some, finally somebody with balls. It was easier to understand Trump's racism could attract support from white voters. One might even argue that men could support a candidate who advocated violence against women. But how could women vote for such a misogynist monstrosity? That's the question. They almost appear to be asking for sympathy because men can't help themselves from talking this way when they get into locker rooms. They can't help threatening people who are not in the locker room, especially women and have pity for goodness sake on the poor alpha males. Other cases in which famous men got caught with their pants down in the United States during the same period likewise reeked of the same automatic, reflexive, programmed, impulsive, natural, preset, habitual, almost mandatory self-justifications. Anthony Weiner was repeatedly in the headlines for sexting and other acts. I compulsively sought attention from women, he said. These destructive impulses brought great devastation. This is the naturalization of male violence against women. Of all the vicious aspects of Trump's pussy-grabbing pussy comments, the underlying assumption that there was at root something inherently normal and ordinary and unremarkable was what was most frightening. It was the bland acceptance that powerful men are doing what all men wish they could in an almost effortless, banal, and ultimately innocent pursuit of primal needs and pleasures. Yet perhaps we can chart the growth of feminist opposition in the year 2017 to what happened and say that it was produced in no small measure by Trumpian misogyny. From the abortion rights group NARAL, Pro-Choice America to Planned Parenthood, membership and donations are way up in the last 12 months. And then, though I'm still not sure how to explain the Me Too tipping point, my strong hunch is that this as well is part of a popular uprising of angry, nasty women whose revulsion to Trump inspired this wave of outrage, protest, and denunciations. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jacqueline Fuchs. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much, and thank you, Carol, for organizing this wonderful panel. I um, have to say, sorry, I just want to start my stopwatch, actually. I have to say that I came about this paper topic in a, a sort of roundabout way. I didn't actually start this as a conversation about the 2016 elections. Rather, it was a discussion um, with a woman in relation to my American Mosques research project, um, where we were talking about perceptions of American Muslim women who wear hijab. In the course of one of these discussions, this woman I was talking to alluded quite critically to um, this image that you see here, the American flag hijab image. So many of you are familiar with it. Um, you may not be as familiar with the, this, uh, uh, the original photograph that it's based on. Um, and uh, the person I was talking to mentioned this and then mentioned Donald Trump's insulting assumption that uh, the uh, gold star Humayun Khan's mother, Ghazala Khan, had nothing to say. You might remember that whole issue with the Democratic National Convention. I think someone mentioned it as well. <clears throat> so uh, this woman I was speaking with said, well, the hijab makes for these people, Muslim women, into objects. And I was struck by that comment because these people included people that we might really separate out, people on what we think of as the left and what we think of as the right. And these people were brought together um, through this sort of dialogue about the objectification of women. One of my favorite discussions about this issue in terms of the hijab uh, is from fashion blogger and academic Huda Khatebi, who I self-identifies as a Muslim Iranian living in Chicago, and writes a blog called Juju Azad. Uh, and Juju Azad is a site, in her own words, uh, that acts as a site for unapologetic identity rec reclamation aimed at challenging Orientalist mainstream media representations of Middle Eastern hijab-wearing Muslim women. 
Katebi's critique of the American flag hijab picture uh, in an article which is really uh, wonderfully titled, Please Keep Your American Flags Off My Hijab, uh, lists several problems with the image, including male authorship of the image, the problems associated with patriotism, the idea that hijabs to her are a rejection of consumerism that the flag to her stands for, the ways in which American Muslims are asked to prove their Americanness, in this case through dress, American aggression abroad against many Muslim communities, which makes this idea of then draping a flag over someone particularly problematic. But most importantly, she overall reminds us uh, that in the same way that many feminist anthropologists do, that fashion is political, right? That fashion is political in so many different ways, from the economics of it, where we have to talk about sweatshops and production, the import and export laws which keep some countries in and some countries out. Um, that fashion can be used as public art. It can be a part of protests where people put forward their ideas. Fashion is about the performance and reproduction of gender norms. So it can allow people to burst out of those norms at times and it can also hem them in. Uh, it can be about the problems of cultural appropriation uh, when we bring pieces of fashion together in ways that may not have originally been intended. And of course, the role of consumerism, capitalism, consumption. And this, I think, is the conversation that we need to be a part of as feminist anthropologists. And I find it interesting to turn these reflections and these conversations that we were having about the American flag hijab back on the pantsuit, right? That ubiquitous fashion item in these elections, which I think played a, a really significant role. Clinton's pantsuits had a really interesting history associated with feminism. Of course, people spoke about the white pantsuit and its relation to suffrage clothing and, and white as well as the, this idea of the pantsuit as adapting to patriarchal models of power, right? Co-opting this notion of ma masculine dress or accepting it. There's a, there's a bit of a discussion and argument to be had there. You can think of it as associated with consumerism, 1980s yuppieism and the sort of metropolitan uh, identity. You can think of it as anti-feminine, uh, some people has written of the pantsuit, or the new feminist power. Many, many different ways to go about that. Pantsuits also became the rally and cry for the pantsuit flash mobs. Um, and I don't know if we can play this video. So I just took a couple of videos thinking about the pantsuit flash mobs and thinking about how this article of clothing became a rallying cry. It was a symbol of women's power. It's also about playful solidarity. Chris mentioned before Judith Butler's work about notes towards a performative theory of assembly. The pantsuit flash mobs had this power of um, creating a space, a performative expression place where people were vulnerable, where people had emotions. In fact, when I was preparing this talk, I um, got most teary-eyed watching the pantsuit flap flash mob videos. <laughs> Um, these also became a focal point for the Facebook group, Pantsuit Nation, as first a secret Facebook group um, that later became sort of a support group for many people. But of course, pantsuits can be flash, uh, excuse me, flash, I'm still got it in my head, uh, commoditized as well. So the Pantsuit Nation became a book, and many people argued about the appropriateness of that. Um, we have Hillary Clinton play sets with paper dolls and you can put a pantsuit on her. We have uh, the pantsuit dolls and of course it was co-opted by the right in ways so that you have the orange pantsuit for the lock her up crowd, right? Um, which brings me, of course, to the role of misogyny in last year's elections. Um, I also think, uh, I didn't include it, but that nutcracker you had was a pantsuit nutcracker as well. So the pantsuit was an important part of this commodification. Pantsuits, um, became almost a scapegoat in the end, I think. Misogyny takes many forms. It can be women's voices silenced, the issues that, women's ra that women raise uh, redirected, women used as token objects rather than understood as agents, women's art and expression trivialized. In our so session summary, there was a the point that post-election discussions draw upon long-standing cultural and religious models that blame women for personal and societal disasters. I think clothing is one of those models. This is a common cultural vehicle for misogyny. Women are blamed for clothing. We only need to look at rape narratives to think about that. Um, we are objectified through clothing. There exists in our, in our society a long-standing cultural model through which women's clothing narratives, protest, art, piety, gender embodiment, and I'm thinking here of bra burning, hijab wearing, pantsuits, pussy hats, all of these types of uh, ways of thinking about clothing. Um, these are all co-opted and transformed. Sometimes they can be transformed into passive objects of ridicule, desired objects to be obtained, 
jeans, commodified forms, and the pink pantsuit that was in the fashion magazines in the spring after the elections, um, the big thing in uh, March, April, get ready for the pink pantsuit nation, um, sort of showed us this as well. Thus, as feminist anthropologists, we need to pay attention to the multivocality of symbols. No symbol is inherently good. All can be used in a variety of ways. The American flag hijab can be both a meaningful image of American diversity and a problematic use of hijab wearing Muslim women as token others. The pantsuit can be both subverting and catering towards specific ideas of gendered power norms. The implications of these uh, understandings for action are a few. First of all, I, I think about um, feminist anthropological perspectives helping us um, to question co-opted narratives. We should ask, as Saba Mahmoud does in The Politics of Piety, what feminism looks like outside of the common conceptualization of feminism as resistance, to recognize agency as historically and culturally specific, to better understand the context of use and misuse, and to represent the complexity of all of these stories. What happens if we don't? We end up with this commodified resistance of the Pepsi commercial, the Jenner Pepsi commercial that many of you may have seen, where it's all the forms of resistance without the meaning, um, and it's all for Pepsi, color coordinated, and it's solved simply by giving a Pepsi. Decontextualized, commercialized resistance set up with the idea of inclusivity through the use of clothing without meaningful social engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jane and Reese. Hi. So, thank you very much, Carol, for including me in this. Um, as a researcher on issues of gender, race, and ethnicity, and economics both in the United States and at different places of the world, I, before the election of 2016, would be often asked to give talks um, in different nations about, well, comparing conditions of women and girls in the United States with those elsewhere. And I would always explain to those who were inviting me that conditions in the United States were problematic and not necessarily successful, despite that I would be asked, in part because the intent would be to gain information, to learn from the United States. Since the election results of 2016, I have not been asked to speak about the United States. <laughs> so today, I've been asked to talk about successes. <laughs> but the difference is that I'm going to focus on those successes that have occurred, some in the United States, although as has been said so well, not to a substantial extent and certainly not to the extent we would prefer. Um, and these successes are critical. The successes are critical because one thing that perhaps has not been mentioned, or at least I didn't catch it, is that when women are elected, regardless of their background or their affiliation, we find that they do tend to vote for policies and programs that help all women. All right, so it is important that women get elected. So we need these successes for all women and girls. Even if, and this is particularly, this, well, this isn't just true in the United States, but this is true all over, even if we have to fight for those successes again and again. So I'm going to briefly describe um, some of the characteristics that seem to cross these different uh, successes where they have occurred. And I'm going to start with the one that's the most obvious. And I think that those of you in this room are all no doubt doing this. I know many of you are. Um, so you need to strengthen women's participation by encouraging them to vote. And that also includes making it possible for them to vote. And in other words, um, getting them to the place to vote, making sure that they have identification if it is now required to vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, making sure that they participate in campaigning. That's uh, very critical so that they know how to, to run successfully themselves and will do so and have the networks to begin with. And then finally that they run, well no, not finally, but that they run for office and then finally that you vote for them. 
So then the next one, which might not seem quite as obvious, but relates both to voters and to those who are running for office, is that you st support stable employment and higher earnings for women relative to those of men because you need to narrow wage gaps. We find again and again in the research on women candidates around the world and in the United States that campaigning costs and women disproportionately become dependent on political bosses, partners, etc., in influencing their votes or not even getting them elected. So making sure that across races, women are supported in their income levels is critical. One of the things, um, I really appreciated the, the, uh, Matt's point that it was, has not been mentioned that the working class includes women. Classes in general, too, are gendered. They're racialized, so there are gaps within classes in terms of whether you measure class by income, wealth, or educational level. So they're racialized, but they're also gendered, so that women have to have a higher level of education to make the same as a man. And this actually gets worse at higher levels of income. So that all of these intersectional issues, and if you want more information, um, I can recommend a great website for the statistics on all of this about the United States. But all of these problems, all of these intersectional issues combine so that, going back to this issue, support stable employment and higher earnings for women, wherever you work, wherever you live. Now, keeping in mind with that, vote for policies and programs where you work and, and live that create better infrastructure and supports. And that is so that people, everyone where you live and work, not just you and those you care about, can afford to live there and support their families so that they don't become financially dependent or are less financially dependent. Um, for whatever reason. It makes it also easier to run for office. Now, these three points tie together inextricably. Um, and one thing that you might not all be aware of, those of you who um, teach full time at universities, is that in the United States, nearly a quarter of all college students are struggling not to drop out because they are also supporting children. So one thing that can be done to help with political participation is this access to childcare that you know, the AAA has done nicely here um, for this conference, but also needs to be done better on campuses. In fact, what's happening we see across the United States is that childcare opportunities for students are being withdrawn. Healthcare. I know this might not seem relevant, but healthcare includes and relates to some of the issues that were discussed previously about sexual harassment and, and violence, making this better for women and girls. And finally, and this is a topic that's also been talked upon, dealing with class, race, and gender, age. So that relatively, so that younger women face relatively greater economic problems than younger men in the United States. This is, we find this as we trace their economic outcomes and what they're going to be able to gain both in terms of income and in terms of savings over the course of their life. So what we're seeing now is a disproportionate quantity of all women entering retirement who are poor not just relative to men, but in terms of um, poverty measures. But we know that younger women, were, as we, as we um, calculate the trajectories, right now are disadvantaged. We are finding that, for example, just to give you the most recent, jobs have returned in the United States, in, as you know, and you've been hearing the Trump administration claim credit, but jobs for women have been lost, so that the jobs that are gained have been almost exclusively for men. 
I realize this might seem hard to imagine as you look at the amazing women, young women, that you see in your classrooms, in your homes, in your communities. They are facing even greater challenges, especially young women of color, but all young women, than many of us did. So again, vote for, think in terms of pro pro programs and policies to make these things better. Because what we want is not only the changes and the successes, but as I said, we have to fight for again and again, but we would like them to endure. So on that note. Thank you. Next we have Yolanda Moses. Hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to have, to have been invited to give a f just a few remarks, and they will be few. Uh, I have a couple of observations, a couple of um, uh, research points, places I think we can go based on all the things that we've heard here, and a couple of actions. Um, and because I'm a, also part of the second wave of feminism in the 70s, both, I was involved at both the women's movement and the civil rights movement. And both of these are unfinished. They've hit walls and there's, there's deep resistance. And part of us as anthropologists is understanding how to push through that with our research and with the work that we do. Observation, vision, picture Trump's cabinet, white males, Every picture, official picture, table full of white males, old white males, suits, ties. What is wrong with this picture? There are students in my classes who don't see anything wrong with that picture. Okay, second thing, Confederate flag, Confederate statues, the idea that <clears throat> these um, folks want to keep their culture. Their culture is very gendered in terms of what males do and females do, right? The last one, lest we think it's just older people, the picture of the young men with the tiki torches marching through the streets of Charlotte. And <clears throat> you might say, well, what does this have to do with women. <laughs> what does this have to do with Hillary Clinton and the election? It's a part of what this panel has been talking about, and that is how embedded in our notions of what is normal is a notion of male leadership and males empower that, that idea of patriarchy. And it goes to the fact that <clears throat> our theorizing, as we do research moving forward, our theorizing has to get at the deep-seated cultural notions that are often invisible, that are not easily articulated, that we're trying to understand, that we can tra help translate into policy and into action. What do I mean by that? That there is resistance that is often invisible, but manifests itself in the kind of pushback that women get. Now on the one hand, that means women are being effective at some level, right? I mean, they're there. But on the other hand, it's like two steps backwards so that those gains are being taken away. And the idea of um, making those things visible, that the marching in the street is one thing, but the taking away birth control, the taking away the ability of women to get health care, the taking away of women to decide what to do with their bodies, that's the handmaiden's tale. And that's happening right now. And so we have to do that. Understanding the deep-seated cultural ingrainment of the brutality of hypermasculinity in this culture the leaning toward the military, the understanding that they will take care of everything. This is us leaning politically toward 
fascism. And so we need to understand the difference between fascism and nationalism and what that means. And so the question is, is there a place in the United States for a, a democracy that is inclusive, that has a place for women that is an equitable place. And what we're seeing now is that's not happening. So if I were to put together a, uh, and I was talking with Peggy about this earlier, uh, to symbolize this, you'd have like a, the Russian dolls, right? The, the tiny one is Hillary Clinton in the election. The next one out is looking at um, what's happening with um, uh, sexual assault, which was talked about here. That's a part of the, the, the picture. Another one out is, is anti-choice. Another one are the murders that happen to women in this society and without, with impunity, as been talked about. Another one out is the ubiquitous nature of domestic violence that doesn't get commented on. All this points to a structural, not just cultural, but a structurally reinforced devaluation of women and what women can contribute. So questioning patriarchy is not just at the family level. It goes out to the social, uh, the, the extended family, it goes out to society, and it is now global if we look at what's happening with war and rape and terror, and how women are used in making the point that you are, ob you are an object. And so our work has to be getting at how to shift that paradigm or to talk about what the levers and the triggers are for shifting that paradigm. Oops. <laughs> and I want to end on one note. And this is the movement Black Lives Matter where it is led by men and women, but there are three key women who said we started, yes, in the streets, but we're now going to another phase, and that is forming coalitions with other like-minded people to change the makeup of the local government and then the state government and then the national government. It's a strategy that was used in 1968. You've heard of, I don't know if you heard the Southern strategy, but it was a long-term strategy for white people in the South to take back the US. Well, I think we should have our own gender strategy for taking back the US and democracy. <laughs> Thank you, and next we have Peggy Sande. Hello, I wanna take a somewhat different track today by talking about my own personal history uh, with uh, sexual violence and sexual assault and how it led me to think as an anthropologist uh, by looking at other societies to try to understand and get some uh, comprehension of whether or not sexual assault and sexual violence is universal. I found that it is not in my studies but I do want to talk about how my own experience with it as a child growing up and in, in the university and so forth as a student led to my writing. Now I've written uh, a number of books, but one article socio so called The Sociocultural Context of Rape, which was published in 81 and which was a cross-cultural study of the factors associated with rape cross-culturally, and I found some very interesting uh, uh, findings uh, that met where men were involved closely in chi with childhood 
and child rearing, there was little rape in the society. I can't, I only have a few minutes, so I can't go into more detail. And then the next book was Female Power and Male Dominance on the Origins of Sexual Inequality. And I found some specific um, correlates of, sex, of male dominance and sexual inequality and sexual equality. There are a lot of societies that anthropologists have studied where women are equal or play very dominant roles in one realm with men in another, uh, in, uh, who had dominant roles in another realm. Now, this was also uh, <clears throat> part of my research in West Sumatra uh, with the Menankabao uh, Matrilineal Society, one of the largest in the world and one of the most matrilineal societies in Indonesia. And then I wrote a book called A Woman Scorn, Acquaintance Rape on Trial, and another book um, which was uh, Fraternity Gang Rape, Sex, Brotherhood, and Privilege on Campus. Now, during, uh, these books started in 81, and the last one was in 96. Um, I think it's very important to understand that I came to all of this work with a background of having experienced sexual assault. When I was uh, 14 years old, I grew up in Washington and in a, and in a local church nearby here, uh, up in Chevy Chase. I was assaulted on the uh, uh, <clears throat> basketball court by three guys that I knew. And um, they pushed me against the wall and for some, and this was 66 years ago, for some reason or another, I had no idea what was going on. I saw the power, I saw the, their faces, I saw them reaching out with the ball, and I, I, I ran, I ran, and I never said anything about it to anyone for 66 years. Um, the first time I ever said anything about it was in a situation like this at the University of Pennsylvania when the, a student of mine was told me that she had been gang raped by members of a fraternity on campus. That led to several of my books, that experience uh, that she des described. And I, then I looked at other fraternities and found uh, similar uh, things happening. So the fraternity gang rape book was based on actually a number of uh, examples of what I experienced, but I wasn't drunk at, at the age of 14. I wasn't, I didn't have any idea what was happening. I was totally sober. I thought these were nice guys and I believed in inequality. In now, the, uh, I think we all, we all have to, under, I think many of us had, had experiences like this. I was also assaulted by a faculty member when I was in grad school, uh, as well as the, the boys uh, in the gym. Uh, and, and, I, and I know many students who've had the, these issues. Now my question is, why is it coming out now? I wrote these, the, my books, the last one was 96. Why is it coming out now? And I only have to say I can't answer because I have to study it as an anthropologist. And that's what I've done throughout my career, look at, to look at human suffering and violence against women or violence in any, in any respect and try to understand it. Have I finished? Go ahead. Oh, okay. So, Everything that we've heard today is very important intellectually, but I, I want us to remember what's going on inside of our heads. Uh, why do men do this? Um, under what circumstances psychologically leads them to do this? Why, why would, at a fraternity at Penn, why would they have raped uh, a student of mine who, who told me her story after she was absent from class for two weeks and started, and started a, a, a um, 
program and a uh, action against this kind of behavior at Penn uh, in, in the, well, she came to me in the 80s sometime. And at this time, it was just beginning to, there were other, there were colleagues of mine, not many, in other uh, university who were beginning to look at acquaintance rape. I mean, when did you first hear about acquaintance rape? It was in the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm only present presenting this because as, as, as an anthropologist myself, I needed to understand it, but I've also whetted my internal, my, my, my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences, what I've felt uh, with, in some sense, with taking anthropology as a means to understand it better. Okay. Oh, I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anybody want to ask a question? <laughs> uh, now, she said I could go on. So could I ask, ask someone to t tell us something or ask a question that we may not have answered? <laughs> We've answered all the questions, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, let's open yeah. 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 Open it up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to make a, a quick announcement that um, Ed Lebo was unfortunately not um, able to attend the session due to competing responsibilities with the executive board. Um, but his email is on the bottom of the PowerPoint so that you can email him if you'd like to see a copy of his paper. I'm sure he'd be glad to provide it. But we wanted to make sure due to um, the many panelists that we had who, who shared um, really interesting remarks that there would also be time for audience questions and participation um, with the panel. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> there. Oh, let's take one. Question, question. Yeah, please. Or comment. Comment. I love it. It's just wow to, to <laughs> speechless. Is it where do we start on such a huge issue? I think I see this. Uh, you. Because it's not just about 2016. It's the larger. It's the larger picture in the in 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 if, the United States. If you States have a question, and cross culturally. It's, I'm sorry, that, sorry, but if you have a question, it's really hard to see you, um, just so that you know, because the lights are in our eyes. But yeah, go ahead and go to the mic. Yeah, well, you spoke about women rights that are always questioned. But as a feminist, do you think that we did enough for Iranian women when, uh, when the, it became a theocracy? I mean, from one day to the other, the women became the slaves of the of the patriarchy. So, uh, and where 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 were we as feminists to push our government to impose um, to impose some consen political consequences? I mean, even recently, we've, uh, we've negotiated with Iran, and the question of the women was never mentioned. So this was my question, because we're speaking about today about the president, but it happened, uh, it's the same thing that ha in worst, of course, that happened in Iran. So uh, as women, I guess we should mobilize ourselves more. So I'd, I'd sort of like to respond to that in a broader way because one of, there were two kinds of um, basic questions that panelists were going to try to address. One is what kind of research can we do as anthropologists? And it seems in the case, one of the questions um, is what are we defining as important issues? And I think, Jane, what you said about when women are in power, 
they tend to pursue certain kinds of issues within the State Department, such as women's rights, which did happen under Hillary Clinton, and which is not going to happen now. So the kind of foreign policy we pursue, whether we critique Saudi Arabia for its gender apartheid or continue selling it huge amount of weapons, all of those are policy issues which anthropologists can address in their own research, but also as activists, I think we have to start writing more op-ed types of pieces that get in the news that address those kinds of issues or letters to the editor or bring it up in class. So there are the two different kinds of pieces, the research we do and the kinds of things that we point out critically, and then what we can do to get beyond our own community and start affecting uh, journalists and other people who are carrying things. Does anybody else want to address that? Can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, or I'd, I'd like, when I was researching when gender studies started in the States, uh, I f do believe that the first Women's Studies Department in the States was founded at San Jose. That is probably true. I have yeah. heard that too. Yes. Way before Harvard and Yale had women's mm -hmm. studies, San Jose State had the first women's studies. And I'd just like to link this up with Michaela's point before that the sort of tendency towards elitism in our ins educational institutions makes us forget some of our allies, and some of them are working class black families, and some of them are just working class, lower, lower level educational uh, institutions that we tend to neglect because we're looking at higher levels of power. And I think we need to remember that women's movements have always been, when they work, uh, popular at base. Other, there's just no other way to get them going. And so I think as we are in the academic world, we should mm -hmm. be thinking what are the alliances we can make with other educational institutions, not just other groups in society, but less well-ranked educational institutions. That's where a lot of more original thinking gets done and a lot of energy comes from. So that was just, it's a comment more than a, than a question. Well, I should say in terms of San Jose State, which is where I taught for yeah. 20, yeah. Um, it's not just a matter, San Jose State's Women's Studies program has been very poorly funded. And I think a lot of the feminists at very elite, expensive, well-funded institutions need to collaborate with people who are working at public institutions, which is where the majority of first-generation women who are also working simultaneously who do have children. It's a very different population than at some of the other kinds of institutions that people work at. Could, could, could I also say something? Historically, it, <clears throat> women's studies and black studies, ethnic studies in general, came out of the pol political movement yes. and was, they were connected. Yes. And then as these programs became more respected in the universities, they became more disassociated from those groups. And so it's almost like we have to go back and claim that heritage, right? It's not new, it's lost because it was there. It Yolanda was. And, and Michaela, because we're all sort of the same generation, my experience of the civil rights movement in the 60s in the early 60s is that there was no connection with feminism at all, and I hate to say that, but that is true. And there has been some discussion of that subsequently, um, but it is true that within the California State University was sort of initiated ethnic and women's studies, sometimes those were linked, but that certainly was not my experience in the 60s of the civil rights movement in Berkeley and elsewhere but it was in Berkeley in the 70s. A little more, yes. There was a lag. Hello. Um, first, thank you so much for your talks today. I really enjoyed them. Um, and this is more a, a comment. Um, my sister uh, attended an elite university and uh, got a degree in gender studies. Um, 
And it was a wonderful education. Um, and it was, but what was really interesting is that there was very little discussion about uh, women's issues. Um, it was more focused on LGBTQ issues, which is obviously very important, and women's issues and LGBTQ issues are very much intertwined. Um, but her education did nothing to help or did little to help her understand her position as a young woman in society. What did educate her, unfortunately, was her rape. Um, it was after that that she discovered what her education had been lacking. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and an Ill inability to understand what had happened to her. So this, I think this is a comment on um, being careful uh, about the kind of uh, education that we offer. That it's important to follow um, academic um, fads and, and, and new and new knowledges, it's so important, but also to keep our eyes on the workings of power that continue to circulate and, and control our lives. So yeah, that's my comment. I'd like to respond to that. Of course. When, when I uh, was working with the student, my student who was gang raped. Oh yeah. When I was working with this, my student who was gang raped, um, I didn't tell you the whole story, which, which is even worse than what, what I already said. Uh, the boys who were involved were sent, their only punishment was to come to me and, and talk to me. <laughs> and um, at the same time, when my female colleagues in the university heard I was writing this book, they all left me alone. They were all extremely silent. I, I would never understood that, <coughs> which is why I'm so happy to, to see us today as a group talking like we are, because I didn't have any support whatsoever, and those boys never, never got punished. Well, their only punishment was to come and talk to me, and, they, and their voices are in the book. Mm. <coughs> I think it has changed uh, somewhat. Did it change for your sister? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think it was very sad that she could only name what had happened to her as rape once the hospital asked her if she wanted to press charges. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of she hadn't had any <coughs> education um, beyond, you know, with her friends about acquaintance rape and things like this. Um, so she didn't, she didn't have, she didn't have in, in, tools, you know, mm -hmm. even as a very highly educated woman, you know, and so, um, yeah. May I also respond? Please. Um, as another rape survivor and a, a volunteer for Rape Crisis Center in Berkeley, I think that what's key here in terms of the academic world is what kind of gender studies program is this? Mm -hmm. It's not does it stress LGBTQ, mm -hmm. it's, does, it's does it stress it from a left perspective? Mm. Because if you have the left perspective, you're not going to forget straight women. Mm -hmm. You're not going to forget people of color. Mm -hmm. You're not going to forget women and men around the world. They have to be included. They will be included, they will be part of your analysis, and that's that, mm -hmm. and had your sister had those gender studies courses, and I'm speaking as someone who's taught in five different gender studies programs, things would have been different for her. Maybe she still would have been assaulted, but she would have understood it differently. She also might have gotten past it, through it faster as I did, as a former rape crisis counselor when I was in the rape situation. I would have been killed otherwise. Hmm. Yeah, and damn near killed her, so, mm. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Susan, do you want to say Thank, thank you. you for your comment. Hi, thanks for, your, for organizing and participating in this panel. Um, I have a question about like blame and responsibility with regard to the election. I know a lot of my friends and I were sort of like grappling about the statistic that many of you mentioned about the 53%. Yeah of women polled um, vote, voted for Trump. Um, 
But I wonder if we are, um, like, I'm, I'm totally saying, and I'm totally in agreement that we need to like self-critique um, feminism, et cetera. Um, but I also wonder if we're sort of like skirting responsibility. Mm -hmm. we're, well, we're we're basically like taking on more responsibility than we. Um, uh, wait, let me reframe this. I think that the self-critique can sometimes be a conflation of gender with women, and it doesn't necessarily look at, for example, toxic masculinity, the role of Fox News, right. the role of the Christian right, the right. role of things like focus on the family. Um, another statistic, which I'm not sure if you mentioned, was the, I think one of you did actually, was the role of cr Christian conservatism yes. in that. Yeah, you did, Carol. Um, and so maybe we should be looking at toxic masculinity and the reassertion of patriarchy more so than self-blaming. So I definitely agree with that. I think there's a kind of blaming of Euro-American women that is problematic. The gender gap was never greater in this election, never greater. And so I, again, it, it's so easy to just do that because we've been doing that for so long. And I think the kind of research that Susan is doing um, and that um, is being done with Euro-American um, in Tea Party states, um, Cox Child's research, looking at the gender part of it is really, really crucial. 80% of evangelical Christians voted for Trump. I think they're asking us to Okay. Us Thank you so much. I Please hope feel free to send them. I, uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, and the conversation is starting.